I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the 11th chapter of the OpenStack Psychology Textbook. Today we'll be discussing personality, what it is, what Freud thought about it, the Neo-Freudians, the humanistic approaches, the biological approaches, the trait theorists, etc. So personality is our long-standing traits and patterns that propel individuals to consistently think, feel, and behave in specific ways. Our personality is what makes us unique individuals, and they're thought to be long-term stable and not easily changed. The historical perspectives on personality, um, these go from the ancient to uh, 100 years ago. Uh, Hippocrates thought that personality was based on four fluids or humors. So there was a caloric temperament, which was due to yellow bile from the liver, a melancholic temperament, black bile from the kidneys, a sanguine temperament, which is red blood from the heart. I can't believe I'm teaching this uh, in the 21st century and a phlegmatic temperament, which is from white phlegm from the lungs. Now Galen, so Hippocrates was Greek, Galen was Roman, and he built on uh, that theory, and he suggested that diseases and personality differences were explained by imbalances in the humors, and Galen's theory was popular for about a thousand years and lasted throughout the Middle Ages. In the 19th century, skipping ahead uh, several millennia, Franz Gall said that bumps on the skull reveal personality traits, character, and mental abilities. And his pseudoscience was called phrenology. So uh, if you've ever heard the expression, you should have your head examined, that's phrenology. That's Franz Gall. Now, Freud said that unconscious drives, influenced by sex and aggression, along with childhood sexuality, influence our personality. So this is something to remember. Freud was a medical doctor, not a psychologist. He published a book called Studies on Hysteria with Joseph Brewer, and Freud thought that hysteria was the result of sexual abuse in childhood, and he actually called it the seduction hypothesis. But Brewer disagreed, and they went their separate ways. And this, uh, one of the patients in this book uh, was a, a, probably the most famous patient in psychoanalytic theory, which is Anna O. Oh, and she was actually a patient of Brewer's, not of Freud's. Freud proposes this idea that there are levels of consciousness. And what is conscious? Well, if we're conscious, that's mental activity we can access at any time. And so Freud said about one-tenth of our mind is conscious. The unconscious is where mental activity uh, occurs that we're unaware of and unable to access. And so unacceptable urges and desires are repressed there. Freud compares our mind to an iceberg so that most of it is below the surface. And so you can see the difference between consciousness and uh, the unconscious. Freudian slips or malapropisms are sexual or aggressive urges, but research shows that they tend to occur when we're tired, nervous, or not at optimal levels of cognitive functioning. Personality developed from a conflict between two forces, according to Freud, biological, aggressive, and pleasure-seeking drives versus the internal control of those drives. So the id, the ego, and the superego. And so to be clear, these all exist in the unconscious mind, according to Freud. So the id contains our most primitive drives or urges, and it operates on the pleasure principle. So it's, uh, it's present from birth and it directs the impulses for hunger, thirst, and sex, and it seeks immediate gratification for those urges. The superego acts as our conscience and moral compass, and it strives for perfection and judges our behavior. And it develops as uh, from when you're a child and you interact with others and learn the social rules for right and wrong. The ego is the rational part of our personality, and it is considered to be our, what we would consider the self to be. And that means that it's the part of our personality that's seen by others. And the ego operates on the reality principle. And what this means is that it helps the id satisfy its desires in a realistic way, 
without getting too much crap from the superego about how you're, you're not being a good person. So neurosis is caused by imbalances in the system that can lead uh, to the tendency to experience negative emotions, anxiety, or unhealthy behaviors. So that's Anna Freud uh, pictured there. And she's the person who actually formalized uh, this idea of defense mechanisms. So feelings of anxiety result from the ego's inability uh, to mediate the conflict between the id and the superego. So we develop defense mechanisms, which are unconscious protective behaviors that aim to reduce anxiety. Now, they operate in a way that distorts reality, and we're unaware that we're using them. So, for example, um, I'm not going to, your book lists them all, but I'm just going to talk about um, uh, repressed memories because we've talked about that before and sublimation. So if a memory is too overwhelming, it might be repressed and therefore it's banished to the unconscious. It's removed from conscious awareness. And this came up with lost and recovered memories that people have um, uh, experienced through uh, during therapy. Sublimation is kind of one of my favorites because I think it has funny implications. Uh, this defense mechanism is where we redirect unacceptable desires through socially acceptable channels. So, for example, if you have this desire to cut people up, you know, most of the time you get put in prison for that. But if you're a surgeon, we're more than happy to pay you a large income and you can cut people up all day. And so you get to act out what you really want to do. Similarly, if you want to hang around dead people all the time, people might look at you uh, a bit askance. But if you're a mortician, then there you go. You have made your, you've redirected your unacceptable desires through a socially acceptable channel. What are the stages of psychosexual development? Well, these are the stages of child development in which a child's pleasure-seeking urges are focused on specific areas of the body called erogenous zones. A perceived climate of sexual repression and limited education about human sexuality heavily influenced Freud's perspective. Um, there's been some disagreement about that whole idea of a climate of sexual repression in Vienna during that time, though. It may have just been Freud. So let's talk about the stages and, and what happens in each and the implications thereof. The oral stage is from birth to one year and pleasure is focused on the mouth. You can see this in adults who smoke, drink, overeat, or bite their nails, that they're fixated in the oral stage. And Freud says that may be because they were weaned too early or maybe too late. The anal stage is one to three years uh, it's all about toilet training, folks. That's when pleasure is experienced in the bowel and bladder movements. So uh, as an adult, the anal retentive personality is stingy and stubborn and has a compulsive need for order and neatness, whereas the anal expulsive personalities are messy, careless, disorganized, and prone to emotional outbursts. So please don't be too harsh or too lenient in your child's toilet training. The phallic stage occurs between ages three and six, and that corresponds to the age when children become aware of their bodies and recognize the differences between boys and girls. Conflict arises when a child feels a desire for the opposite sex parent. So boys go through the Oedipus complex where they fear their father and they wish to possess their mother. Now, the reason why they fear their father, so this is very incestuous, okay? They fear their father because they're afraid that he's gonna find out about their desire for their mother and he will castrate them. So Freud says that men uh, experience castration anxiety. Now, the electric complex is the equivalent of the Oedipus complex, um, but in women, but actually it wasn't proposed by Freud, it was proposed by Carl Jung. And he said that girls are angry that their mothers did not provide them with a penis, and so therefore they experience penis envy. The latency period, uh, it's not actually a stage because there's no sexual feelings, but this is six years old to puberty. 
Uh, it's a period when sexual feelings are dormant as children focus on other pursuits. And that's things like school, friendships, hobbies, and sports. Peers of the same sex serve to consolidate a child's gender role identity during this period. And then the last stage for Freud is the genital stage, and that's from puberty on. And that includes a sexual reawakening as the incestuous urges resurface. But this time, the young person redirects those urges to socially acceptable partners. And mature sexual interests uh, cause a strong desire for a sexual relationship with an appropriate partner. Well, let's move on now to the Neo-Freudians, with Neo meaning new and Freudian meaning Freudian. So Alfred Adler founded the school of psychology called Individual Psychology, and he actually had worked with Freud for years. They, they eventually split over, um, well, you can have a good idea. Freud focuses a lot on sex and other uh, people didn't. So Adler focuses on our drive to compensate for feelings of inferiority, but I think I should point out that Adler was under five feet tall. So people's theories about everyone might have a lot to say about themselves as people too. He talks about this inferiority complex and that's a person's feelings that they lack worth and they don't measure up to the standards of others or of society. So Adler believes in the importance of social connections. And so the fundamental social tasks which we all must experience include things like careers, friendship, and finding an intimate partner. He also believed in the importance of birth order. And so things like oldest kids are, uh, oldest children tend to be very responsible. Youngest children are very spoiled. I was a youngest, well, I still am a youngest child and I am spoiled, so that must be true. Research on the topic remains inconclusive though. Eric Erickson was encouraged to study psychoanalysis by Freud's daughter, Anna, who we saw earlier. And he came to America in 1933. He wanted to get out of Germany because the Nazis had come to power. Now, he believed that personality develops throughout the lifespan, and he identified eight stages of development, each rep which represents a conflict or a developmental task. And we talked about this in an earlier chapter on lifespan development, but you can still see the stages off to the right. Carl Jung developed a theory. He was also uh, a student of Freud's uh, called analytical psychology. And this focuses on working um, to balance the opposing forces of conscious and unconscious thought and the experience within one's personality. Now he has this idea about the collective unconscious and um, oh, I actually, let me go back for a second too, because I wanted to point out that this idea of um, balancing these opposing forces is a continuous learning process. So he believed that it mostly occurs in the second half of your life, which is very different from Freud, who thought your personality was basically set at puberty. So Jung is saying, no, it's, it's like Erickson, it's, it's throughout your whole life. The collective unconscious is a universal version of the personal unconscious, and it holds mental patterns, which are common to us, uh, all of us. And these are ancestral memories called archetypes. And these are expressed through things like literature, art, and dreams. And they reflect common experiences like facing death, becoming independent, and uh, striving for mastery. So just think about the dreams maybe that you have. He proposed two attitudes towards life, introversion and extroversion. So you have to ask yourself, do you get energized by being alone? That would be an introvert. Or by being with others? That would be an extrovert. He also proposes the concept of persona. And this is the mask we adopt that is a compromise between our true self and societal expectations of who we should be. I love that picture of Karen Horney and that is the correct pronunciation. Now, she's one of the first women trained as a Freudian psychoanalyst, uh, but she moved to the United States away from Germany and also away from Freud. She did not agree with him. She disagreed with his focus on psychosexual envy, and instead her theories focused on the role of unconscious anxiety. She said, uh, essentially, that women don't have penis envy, 
And she said, if that was true, then men must have womb envy also. She said it wasn't um, a penis that women were envious of. It was the station in life uh, that men are privileged to have um, in the time that she was living. So in terms of unconscious anxiety, she talks about three different coping styles. Uh, moving towards people is affiliation and dependence. And as adults, um, it's an intensive need for love and acceptance from others. Moving against people is all about aggression and manipulation. And as adults, people tend to lash out with hurtful comments and they exploit other people. And moving away from people is all about detachment and isolation. And these people as adults avoid love and friendship. They seek careers where they don't have to deal with people. Still love that picture. The behavioral perspective. Well, behaviorists view personality as significantly shaped by reinforcements and consequences from the environment. And that's B.F. Skinner holding a pigeon off to the right. Uh, B.F. Skinner is to the right, the pigeons to the left. We learn to behave in particular ways are what the behaviorists believe. That we increase behaviors that lead to positive consequences and we decrease the behaviors that lead to negative consequences. Now, Skinner disagreed with Freud's idea that personality is fixed in childhood. So that's one more person who disagrees with that. He believed that our responses can change as we come across new situations. Albert Bandura presented a social cognitive theory of personality that emphasizes both learning and cognition as sources of individual differences in personality. So he comes up with the concepts of reciprocal determinism, observational learning, and self-efficacy. And that's what we'll talk about next. So reciprocal determinism is this idea that you have cognitive processes, behavior, and context and they all interact with each other. And each factor influences and is influenced simultaneously by the other two. So cognitive processes are our beliefs, expectations, and personality characteristics. Our behaviors are anything that we can do that might be rewarded or punished. And the context is the environment or the situation that we're in. And so that's reciprocal determinism. Bandura's key contribution to learning theory, though, is the idea that much of our learning is vicarious, that we learn by observing someone else's behavior and its consequences. And he calls this observational learning. And he does the famous study with uh, the Bobo doll, which I believe we discussed in the lifespan chapter also. Through observational learning, we come to learn what behaviors are acceptable and rewarded in our culture, and we also learn to inhibit deviant or socially unacceptable behaviors by seeing what behaviors are punished. Self-efficacy, we're still on Bandura here, is our level of confidence in our own abilities, and that's developed through our, so our social experiences. So in observational learning, self-efficacy is a cognitive factor that affects which behaviors we choose to imitate, as well as our success in performing those behaviors. So people who have high self-efficacy believe that their goals are within reach, they have a positive view of challenges, they develop a deep interest in the activities in which they're involved, and they recover quickly from setbacks because they know they're going to be successful eventually. Julian Rotter comes up with this idea of locus of control, and that refers to our beliefs and the power we have over our lives. So people possess either an internal or external locus of control. An internal locus, which we can call these people internals, they tend to believe that most of our outcomes are the direct, are the direct result of our efforts. People who are externals or people with an external locus of control tend to believe that our outcomes are outside of our control and they see their lives as being controlled by other people or luck or chance. No surprise here, but people with an internal locus of control tend to have better lives. They do better academically, they're uh, more independent, they do better in their careers, they're healthier, and they're less depressed. 
Walter Mischel, uh, really some fascinating research here. He found that although behavior was inconsistent across different situations, it was much more consistent within situations. So that a person's behavior is one situ in one situation would likely be repeated in a similar situation. And he contributes the idea of self-regulation, which we would also call willpower. Uh, so when we talk about willpower, what we're really tending to think about is the ability to delay gratification. And this is one of the more famous studies in psychology. So Mitchell designed a study to assess self-regulation in young children. So the child was told that they could either eat a marshmallow now or wait until the researcher returned to the room and then they would get two marshmallows or a toy. There's different versions of the study. Uh, but they have to decide that they're going to delay gratification. What Mitchell found was that young children differ in their degree of self-control, and that had ramifications throughout their lifetime. So children who had more self-control in preschool were more successful in high school. So how you act at four uh, has a huge impact on how you act uh, at 18. So these kids had higher SAT scores, they had positive peer relationships, and they were less likely to have substance abuse issues. As adults, they also had more stable marriages. That's a lot of data from one study. As the third force in psychology, humanism is touted as a reaction to both the pessimistic determinism of psychoanalysis and to the behaviorist's view of humans as passively reacting to the environment. And so they, the humanists would criticize the behaviorists as making people out to be personality-less robots. Abraham Maslow studied people who he considered to be healthy, creative, and productive. And um, that included people like Albert Einstein, Eleanor Roosevelt, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and others, although he never actually saw any clients. Ma those are people he admired. Maslow found such people to be open, creative, loving, spontaneous, compassionate, concerned for others, and accepting of themselves. Um, their families may have felt differently, but he didn't interview them. Let's talk about Carl Rogers. One of Carl Rogers' main ideas about personality regards self-concept, which is our thoughts and feelings about ourselves. So how would you respond to the question, who am I? Your answer, can show how you see yourself. So your ideal self is the person you would like to be. The real self is the person you actually are. And we experience congruence when our thoughts about our real self and our ideal self are very similar. Conversely, when there's a great discrepancy between our ideal and actual selves, we experience a state Rogers calls incongruence, and that can lead to maladjustment. There's Arnold under biological approaches. Now, psychologists who follow this perspective feel that inherited predispositions and physiological processes explain personality. And so they're concerned a lot with issues of heritability. And that's that the proportion of difference among people that's attributed to genetics. So things like leadership, obedience, a sense of well-being, all of these are thought to have, and more characteristics, are thought to have high heritability. They also believe that temperament has a biological basis. And you can break this down to reactivity, how we respond to new or challenging stimuli, and self-regulation, which is our ability to control that response, and that those are two dimensions of temperament. Is there a relationship between body type and temperament? Nope, although it has been studied. Let's talk about trait theorists. Now, they believe that all people have certain traits or characteristic ways of behaving. Gordon Alport organized personality traits into three categories. So there were cardinal traits, and these are ones that dominate your personality. So they're like defining characteristics. And so an example would be, uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with Mr. Grinch from uh, Dr. Seuss. So uh, he was a mean one. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. That is his cardinal trait. Don't worry, I won't sing. A central trait are ones that make up your personality, and secondary traits occur under specific circumstances. Raymond Cattell, who's pictured there off to the right, he identified 16 factors of personality, 
and he came up with a personality assessment called the 16PF. And this has each dimension scored over a continuum from low to high. So things like warmth, perfectionism, there were, those are two of the 16 personality factors. He actually boiled down 171 different traits into those 16 um, personality factors. Hans and Sybil Eisnick founded uh, or focused on temperament, uh, which are inborn and genetically based personality differences. Now they thought people uh, had two personality dimensions. So introversion, extroversion revisited and neuroticism stability. And then they later added another dimension, psychoticism versus superego control. And that people high on superego control have high impulse control and they're more altruistic, empathic, and cooperative. The five factor model is the, the, sometimes called the big five. And these are the personality traits. This is the most popular theory in personality psychology today. And it's the most accurate approximation of the basic trait dimensions. At least that's what the book says, so it must be true. Five factors are openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And so that is easy to remember because you can just think of ocean. That's the mnemonic. Now, I'll say this in full disclosure. I use a five-factor model in all of my research where it's applicable, except I use an instrument which you can uh, Google and you can take the assessment if you like. It's called the Hexaco and that adds honesty and humility as a trait. Conscientiousness and agreeableness increase with age because we get better at managing relationships and careers just through experience, and neuroticism and extroversion decline slightly with age. What about culture and personality? Well, culture is all our beliefs, customs, art, and traditions of a particular society. And there are both universal and cultural specific reasons for variations in personality. So there are researchers that believe that people from Asian cultures are more collectivist and less extroverted and that Europeans are higher in neuroticism. Other folks believe that there are regional differences in the United States and that they may be due to selective migration, which is where people choose to move to places that are compatible with their personalities. What about personality assessment? Well, let's talk about self-report inventories first. And these assess personality using multiple choice or numbered scales. So most famously, the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. And this is one of the most widely used personality inventories developed in 1943. It originally had 504 true-false questions. It was um, modified in 1989 to the MMPI-2, and that was at 567 questions. And then it was changed again um, in 2008. It now has 338 questions, and it takes about an hour to take all these. In addition to clinical scales, it also has validity and reliability scales. So theoretically, they can detect if a person is, quote, faking good. Projective tests uh, rely on defense mechanisms, the defense mechanism of projection, which is an idea proposed by Freud. And the person is led to talk about their feelings, to tell stories, that sort of thing. So I didn't bother to put a picture up of a Rorschach because I think we all know what that is. So you see ink blots, they're symmetrical on a page developed in 1921. And the client says what that really is what they see in the ink blots, and through that they reveal their unconscious struggles. And this has been used to measure depression and anxiety. The thematic app perception test, or TAT, has eight to 12 ambiguous pictures. There's one off to the right, so somebody's sleeping and there's a man standing over him. And then you have to tell a story of what's going on in that picture. And that story is thought to reveal uh, you, you'll project your hopes, fears, interests, and goals onto that picture. Now, <clears throat> because it was developed early in the 20th century, they've now developed a contemporized themes concerning blacks test, and it's like the TAT, but the pictures show scenes of African-American lifestyles. The Rotter Incomplete Sentence Blank test 
is 40 incomplete sentences and you have to complete them as quick as possible. So it's things like, I feel blank, my, mo my mother blank. And that's a good place to talk about all your problems. At least all your APA style problems can be solved you by using my, AP, my Learn APA style book and videos. So when you want to learn to write correctly or write right, consult my book and videos on Learn APA style, which are about writing in psychology and the social sciences. Have a great day and thanks for listening.